Hi, I'm Thomas Harder. I'm Professor and Cooperative Extension Specialist for Groundwater Hydrology in the Department of Land, Air, and Water Resources at the University of California, Davis. Welcome to this presentation on the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act of 2014, also known in professional circles as SIGMA. What I want to go over with you today is three things. I give you a brief review on how drought and overpumping has impacted groundwater. I give you an overview of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, and then dive into some of the management concepts and some of the implementation of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, answering the question of, so what's next? So let's begin by looking at drought and groundwater levels and how that has impacted us, society in general, um, what impacts have we seen? Predictably, in every drought that we have had in the past 40 to 60 years, there's the 1977 drought, there is the drought of the late 80s and early 90s, there was a drought in the early 2000s, in the late 2000s, and then we're currently in a drought since 2011. Predictably, in all of those, groundwater levels in many places go down because groundwater is not replenished at a normal rate and it's being extracted at rates that far exceed the rate of replenishment. In some places, the annual drawdown, the annual drop in water levels may be 10 to 15 feet. In other places, often not far away, that annual drop in water levels from spring to spring may be as much as 40 feet per year. In many areas of California, because of the rapid sequence of droughts that we have seen over the last 15 years. We're now at water levels that are far lower than we have ever recorded in the history of this state. This is showing the change in water levels between the beginning of 2011, when we were just ending a very wet winter, and the spring of 2016. And you can see that in most wells throughout the state that are being monitored by the Department of Water Resources, we have seen far more than 10, often more than 50, and in many cases, even more than 100 feet of drop in water levels. Just uh, between, overall, between the middle of the 20th century, when we had probably the last big period in which groundwater resources were tremendously stressed because California didn't have some of its very large surface water projects, like the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project. Um, since then, and compared to that time, water levels that we have seen over the last three years are significantly lower in parts of the southern Central Valley by more than 50 to 100 feet lower than in those relatively dire times of groundwater uh, of groundwater extraction in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Now, this last winter, the winter of 2015, 2016, was somewhat wetter, but it was barely an average winter in Northern California, and it was, after all, a dry winter in Southern California, and that's very much reflected in the change in water levels just within the last year. Despite the rain that we have seen in Central and Northern California, many wells have continued to drop in water levels due to the large pumping that happened in the summer of 2015, which was not recovered over this last winter. And especially in Southern California, in the southern part of the Central Valley, we've seen continued decrease of water levels. That decrease in water levels has run many wells, mostly shallower, domestic wells, but also many of the irrigation wells dry. People have had to drill new wells at tremendous cost. People had to deepen their wells or drop their pumps. People also had to pump water with a much higher lift. The overall cost of that has been estimated to be on the order of a half a billion dollars per year in 2014 and in 2015. Um, in each of those years. We've seen a record number of wells being drilled in many counties throughout the state, both in the valleys and in the mountains. Um, this has impacted the agricultural economy 
at a scale of a uh, couple billion dollars per year. Uh, we have seen increased seawater intrusion in groundwater basins that are near the ocean. Seawater intrusion occurs because groundwater levels fall below the seawater level, uh, which allows seawater to intrude into aquifers by gravity. In the Salinas Valley, for example, we see seawater intrusion now going almost eight miles to the doorstep of the city of Salinas. We're also seeing a recurrence of subsidence, much like we have seen in the 1950s and 60s, the last time when we've seen rapid changes in groundwater levels. That subsidence impacts many places in the Central Valley, many places in Southern California basins. In 2014, there were places in the Central Valley that have seen subsidence rates on the order of 8 to 12 inches within less than eight months, both in the southern part of the Central Valley, but also in the Sacramento Valley, northwest of Sacramento. Of course, the falling water levels are also impacting ecosystems, including falling water levels in our dry mountains, uh, where springs and seeps have ceased to exist, and it affects our ecosystems on the valley floors of our various groundwater basins across California. So the consequences of being able to rely on groundwater as our largest reservoir, and as the reservoir that makes up for the lack of surface water in these dry years, we have seen a number of impacts even long before we're running out of groundwater altogether. These impacts exist not because we're out of groundwater. These impacts exist because groundwater levels are lowering. Partly in response to this, partly in response to um, a longer term development and policies over the past 20 years, in 2014, the state legislature passed the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. The Sustainable Groundwater Management Act is, is based on two principles. First, that groundwater resources be managed sustainably for long-term reliability and multiple economic, social, and environmental benefits. That is one principle. That's the principle of sustainability. But the other very important principle that this act is based on is the principle that management of groundwater is best achieved locally. Now, sustainability is defined in the act as having no significant and unreasonable, undesirable results. And these undesirable results in return are specifically defined in the act as chronic lowering of groundwater levels, a reduction in groundwater storage, seawater intrusion, degradation in water quality, land subsidence, and surface water depletion and impacts on groundwater dependent ecosystems. These six undesirable results are those that we will have to manage towards avoiding um, in the next 20 years. The local management or overall management of this Sustainable Groundwater Management Act is envisioned as a multi-pronged approach. There will be much public engagement in many of the decisions that will have to be made in managing our local groundwater resources. We will have local agencies involved in groundwater management and we will have state agencies overseeing and supporting these local efforts. So what will happen next? What will this Groundwater Management Act, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, look like over the next 25 years? The very first step will be that by June 2017, groundwater sustainability agencies will have to be formed in all groundwater basins that have been ranked by the Department of Water Resources as medium and high priority basins. Medium and high priority is mostly defined not whether or not there are critical conditions in a groundwater basin, but rather defined by the usage of groundwater and the importance of groundwater to overlying land uses, as well as the availability of groundwater resources in each particular basin. Each of the basins that are colored in orange and yellow on this map is falling into that category of medium and high priority basins 
and essentially the entire yellow and orange colored area of California on this map will have to be governed by a or several groundwater sustainability agencies. There are some basins that the Department of Water Resources under this legislation um, designated as critically overdrafted basins. Basins where we have seen continued uh, drawdown of water levels even in wetter years, and these basins are shown here in purple. The distinction between critically overdrafted basins and basins that are of medium and high priority but not critically overdrafted within the context of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act is that these basins that you see here will have to come up with their groundwater sustainability plans and with management practices two years sooner than the other basins. So who can be a groundwater sustainability agency? Um, first of all, I should say that the Act exempts adjudicated basins and agencies that are functional equivalent to groundwater sustainability agencies from the uh, groundwater sustainability planning. They still have to submit material that is essentially equivalent to a groundwater sustainability plan. Groundwater sustainability agencies can be any local public agency. Those are cities, counties, irrigation and water management districts, special act, act districts, other public agencies that have a responsibility for water supply or water management or land use management. In some areas, we will see new special acts district that are specifically created to do sustainable groundwater management. Now, in the formation of these groundwater sustainability agencies, which will have far-reaching decision power moving forward in terms of managing our local groundwater resources, there has to be a lot of engagement with local stakeholders. What we're seeing is an active dialogue in many areas uh, where stakeholders communicate among themselves, a lot of communication among local agencies. Uh, key stakeholders, key land use owners are getting involved in the planning of GSAs. These GSAs can be one per groundwater basin, it can be many per groundwater basin. Um, there might be each GSA with each having one groundwater sustainability plan. Um, many groundwater sustainability agencies overlying one basin may choose to have one groundwater sustainability plan. So there's a lot of discussion on how to coordinate these groundwater sustainability agencies across a groundwater basin and how to coordinate their planning efforts. Um, there are efforts underway to collect information to find out what do we actually know about our basins, uh, what information is already available. Um, there's much interest in understanding what it is that these agencies do. What is this groundwater sustainability planning process going to look like? People are looking over their fence and looking elsewhere to see what's happening. And much of this process is done very transparently, very open and very publicly. We don't have much time. Um, by, June 2017, by June 2017, all of these agencies have to be officially formed and have their declaration submitted to the Department of Water Resources. In many areas, we can expect these agencies to rely on already existing groundwork, in some, place, in some cases very extensive groundwork on groundwater management. We have groundwater management plans dating back to the early 1990s um, and having been created throughout the 2000s in many places of California shown here on this map. Once these groundwater sustainability agencies are formed, they have five years, or in the case of critically overdrafted basins, they will have three years to develop a groundwater sustainability plan. Now, what is this groundwater sustainability plan? This groundwater sustainability plan is everything that needs to be done to reach the ultimate goal of sustainable groundwater uh, uh, management, which is to maintain sustainability on these six undesirable results. So the California Department of Water Resources in its final regulations on what needs to be in these groundwater sustainability plans has coined the term sustainability indicators. You can see these six symbols for these sustainability indicators uh, indicating, whether or not, indicating whether or not we have lower, lowering of groundwater levels, whether or not we have a reduction in storage 
whether or not we have seawater intrusion, degraded water quality, land subsidence, or surface water depletion. The sustainability indicators will be essentially the speedometers, and much of the management in under the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act will be towards making sure that these indicators are in essentially good status. Let me make an analogy here. Uh, what needs to happen is much like what we do in, say, health management. On the left side in the slide, you see our health management system, your personal health management system, maybe the health management system of a company or, or of an HMO. Um, and on the right side, you see the equivalent in groundwater management. Ideally, we have sustainable groundwater management. We do that through monitoring and assessment. We do that through adaptive supply management and adaptive demand management. We do that through stakeholder engagement. Uh, just like we maintain our health, personal health, through nutrition and exercise, through engagement, and through some monitoring and assessment. Um, some of that monitoring may be just done intuitively. Um, <clears throat> we will have, in, in monitoring our health, we have triggers that tell us whether or not something is wrong with our health. Similarly, there need to be triggers in sustainable groundwater management that tell the groundwater manager and the public whether or not we are getting to a place where we don't want to be. Once we get into that place, we take some extraordinary measures, um, maybe putting in projects that increase the uh, groundwater supply, or putting in conservation project projects, or putting in projects to do demand reduction. Maybe it requires additional monitoring, much like when I'm falling ill with fever, I will measure my temperature probably twice daily rather than never at all. Um, and then we have a state in that health where we are on the health side, perhaps critically ill. That's something that we want to absolutely avoid. And that's what we're managing towards, is avoiding getting to that place of being critically ill. Similarly, in sustainable groundwater management, we want to avoid getting into a place where we have major undesirable impacts. When that happens, then um, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, Chapter 11, uh, falls in place where the state essentially takes over management and may, may implement very drastic measures to make sure that these undesirable impacts are um, discontinued or, re or even reversed. So this principle of having some indicators that help us manage sustainability and along those indicators have a, a status that we would like to achieve, the so-called measurable objectives, having triggers that allow us to trigger management actions and having thresholds and clearly identifying those minimum thresholds above which we want to stay. That's a key part of the groundwater sustainability plan. Having those in place for all six sustainability indicators and monitoring those sustainability indicators on a regular and sufficient uh, basis so we know that we're in, within our measurable objective range we know when we reach triggers and can do certain management actions to avoid um, falling uh, below these triggers and avoid hitting the minimum threshold. And the actions that do need to be taken in identifying those actions, identifying the data that need to be collected to um, make optimal decisions on these actions, that is all part of the groundwater sustainability plan. So going back to the core pieces that are going into groundwater sustainability plan besides the governance issues. The sustainability plans govern the data collection, the monitoring, the modeling, and the assessment of the groundwater basins. They identify and spell out how and what supply management actions may be taken at which point, what kind of groundwater demand management actions may be taken at which point related to certain triggers and how stakeholders, local stakeholders, are being engaged within the groundwater sustainability plan. So seawater intrusion, one example. How do we manage seawater intrusion? An action to avoid seawater intrusion may be to have injection wells that create a seawater barrier near the coast, something that's frequently done in Southern California. Uh, these are examples from the Orange County Water District that, is, uh, that has built injection wells near the coast to build up the water table and avoid seawater intrusion. Other basins have begun to 
in some basins many decades ago, uh, begun to better collect local runoff, put local storage, uh, uh, surface water storage in place, or put local groundwater storage in place to recover their water levels and avoid that seawater intrusion. Uh, we have seen groundwater banking examples in the state where locations that have that space in the subsurface to store groundwater in the long term will bank groundwater for an agency that may be 100 miles away or 200 miles away. They will store that groundwater for use during drought. We've seen that in the current count Kern County Water Bank most, per, most uh, dominantly, but also in many smaller water banks in Southern California. These water banks often operate by either flooding recharge basins, as seen in these pictures, or by using injection valves, uh, where water uh, that is of sufficient quality is directly injected into the aquifer and then later recovered from that same well. Orange County, has put together an entire portfolio of actions that includes um, bringing, bringing in imported water through the state water project. It includes to manage stormwater flows. It includes managing local storage projects, but it also includes the groundwater replenishment uh, project, the groundwater replenishment system, which takes wastewater um, and cleans it, treats it to very high water quality standard before that wastewater is being recharged into the groundwater basin to essentially enhance that groundwater supply. Like other agencies, Orange County Water District, in order to do that, has set itself a measurable objective. Their measurable objective is certain levels of groundwater storage and they operate that groundwater storage between an upper bar and a lower bar and the lower bar being their minimum threshold and then the upper bar being the measurable objective. And their actions will depend on where they are in that cycle. The closer they get to these lower places in their hydrograph, in their groundwater storage hydrograph, um, the more actions they take to avoid further overdraft. In other regions, we may be managing towards environmental flows in surface streams where we try to avoid groundwater pumping, depleting surface water flows. Um, and we can do that through groundwater banking projects that through delayed impacts on streams can support summer flows, um, despite water being actually recharged much, much earlier. So these were some examples of management actions that a local groundwater sustainability agency may take to manage groundwater resources towards meeting the sustainability goal. Now, under the original groundwater management planning efforts that we've had in the 1990s and the 2000s, some of these measures have already been taken. And particularly, in particular, we've seen much groundwater characterization. We've seen some public and agency involvement. We've seen basin management objectives being identified. We've seen some monitoring programs being put in place. But what's new in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act is really an enforcement mandate. Now it's no longer just a plan to plan, but it's a plan to action. And it's a plan to action within, within a very well-defined time framework. It empowers local agencies to do demand management, to integrate their groundwater management with surface water management, to integrate their groundwater management with water quality management, and also with land use planning. Groundwater sustainability agencies have the discretionary authority uh, to conduct studies, to do monitoring and assessment, to register and monitor wells. They can set well spacing to control the groundwater demand. They can require extraction reporting or even regulate extractions. They will most likely initially tend towards primarily focusing on groundwater supply management, increasing recharge, implementing capital projects that help with increasing recharge, these projects have costs associated with them, some of which will be covered through state help, uh, some of which will have to be covered through assessing local fees. Because of these actions and because of the broader implications and the cost of these actions, stakeholder engagement is a critical part of groundwater sustainability planning and the state agencies that oversee the implementation of groundwater, local groundwater sustainability plans will be looking for 
is stakeholder process being spelled out in a groundwater sustainability plan. Now, let me uh, finish this presentation by talking a little bit about uncertainty. Um, we have these sustainability indicators and we will do monitoring. Uh, we will have monitoring programs, defined monitoring programs that specifically tie monitoring data to the sustainability indicators and say, I want certain levels of these monitoring data to have achieved to um, be in good status with respect to sustainability indicators. Those data will inform the local agencies on whether or not they have to do more management actions. And I've already spoken about these four areas that local agencies are getting engaged in. And these actions will then have hopefully the desired impact on the sustainability indicator. Now, the state is setting some regulations um, in its groundwater sustainability planning uh, regulation that are primarily concerned with making sure that local agencies properly monitor, properly identify minimum thresholds and measurable objectives, that the data that are being collected are being reported to DWR, that they're being uh, transparent, that are being collected properly. And <clears throat> the state agency in its regulation and the purpose of the regulations is essentially that there is a solid framework in place that um, uh, moves this groundwater management forward. But a lot of the decisions will be done locally and a lot of the decisions will be done as we learn more about our groundwater basins. So adaptive management is going to be a very essential part of moving forward on this. We will not know right away every action that may be taken over the next 20 years. Much of it will be also integrated with other regional water management actions. There, the um, monitoring program will be designed to provide maximum certainty with respect to understanding what the status is of the sustainability indicators. And we can do that and we have the technology to do that um, uh, rather well. Uh, some of these may be done on a statewide basis through remote sensing, through statewide programs that are implemented by the Department of Water Resources. Much of it will be done at the local level through water level measurements, through water quality measurements, through measurements of stream flows, et cetera, et cetera. There is some uncertainty about how certain management actions may or may not impact groundwater levels and other sustainability indicators. The risk of implementing a project and not having a result resides entirely with the local groundwater sustainability agency. The agency will be very invested in minimizing that risk by understanding as much as they can about their local basins and investing what needs to be invested in monitoring and assessing, assessing the potential success um, and the potential risk of any project that will need to be implemented. So the risk management is really uh, uh, put on or is a burden on the side of the local groundwater sustainability agency. The monitoring the modeling, the processing of the data is at the core of all of these actions as that's the part that will be uh, reported up to the state and will become the measure by which local efforts are going to be evaluated to see whether or not they are successful. Um, if local measures are successful, everything is good. They will be approved by the Department of Water Resources, the plan will be improved, the plan implementation after the plan has been installed will be regularly reviewed and approved. If problems arise, local agencies will work with the Department of Water Resources to correct uh, problems, and if they're not able to correct those problems, um, then there will be intervention by the State Water Resources Control Board, which has then the authority to step in and take over groundwater extraction and also place the cost for taking over onto local uh, landowners. So ultimately, the idea of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act is to be demonstrably in sustainable management operation by 2040, or no later than 2040. And that will be an effort that will require that the groundwater pumping that you see on this chart, which shows the water balance for California's major water regions, the purple part of that bar chart is the groundwater pumping that we rely on. That groundwater pumping needs to be matched by an equal amount of recharge. 
that will be a joint effort focused on local implementation by the groundwater sustainability agencies and their stakeholders in conjunction with assistance and technical assistance, regulatory requirements, and also financial support from the Department of Water Resources and with the State Water Board being the enforcing agency. This last slide shows you some resources, online resources that you can go to. Um, I suggest you stop this video and copy these down if you need to do so. I thank you for your attention and welcome your feedback.